Welcome to the Daily Horror Habit Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Krieger, bringing you daily reviews of current and classic horror movies for your twisted pleasure. Be aware that these reviews and discussions may include spoilers. And as always, I hope you enjoy. I feel like something bad is going to happen to me. It hasn't reached me yet, but it's on its way. The normally tranquil setting of Ararat's mountain dam with Ariel and Alan and Tears joining a Taken too soon. Ten days after Ellie's funeral, stuff started happening around the house. Sounds seemed to come from Ellie's old room. They didn't really relent. So I thought, well, I'll just set up a camera to, you know, see anything. I looked back and there was footage of a figure moving across the hallway. The image was quite unsettling because it certainly looked like Alice. I want you to close your eyes. I usually uh, videotape my sessions. Something was happening inside that house and I wanted to find out what it was. We checked the tapes. There was a ghost in our house. Alice kept secrets. She kept the fact she kept secrets a secret. Something bad is going to happen to me. It hasn't reached me yet, but it's on its way. And it's getting closer. Today's episode of Daily Horror Habit continues the found footage discussion with a look at the minimalist haunting of Lake Mungo, which is currently streaming on Shudder, Prime Video, and Tubi TV. Written and directed by Joel Anderson, 2008's Lake Mungo follows a family grappling with the drowning of their daughter, Alice. But soon after her death, her family begins to experience supernatural events that lead them to uncover Alice's secrets, which might have been better left buried. And joining me to uncover whether this is a haunting or a hoax is none other than returning friend of the show, Bernie. Bernie, welcome back to the show, man. I appreciate it, man. And yeah, I'm uh, I'm ready to get down on whether this was a a hoax or not. This (laughs) is uh, some critical information here. So Lake Mungo is one of those movies that I've heard a lot of hype surrounding. And it's one of those movies where I've heard kind of like the, it runs the gamut right it's a lot of people that are in sort of like the horror circles or whatever that i fall on twitter are like oh this is a fantastic found footage film that's unlike anything you've seen and then i've kind of seen the other end of the spectrum where it's like just another found footage movie so i was really excited too because what little i knew about it it really sounded very similar to uh the taking of deborah logan which is another found footage movie that you and i have talked about previously Um, so I'm interested kind of just to see what your overall take was on Lake Mungo. Um, and if you kind of saw some of the similarities between it and the taking of Deborah Logan, like I did. Uh, definitely did. I mean, first off, this is one of the more unique movies I think we've, we've talked about, uh, unique, definitely in a good and a bad sense. Uh, I think you get, you get best of both worlds in that sense with this movie. But, um, I think that this is this is a little bit more than just a normal horror movie right like if you're looking for a a a bloody or a gory type of movie obviously this isn't really it there's a few graphic i guess you could say scenes in this movie but other than that it's it's relatively uh plain i guess if that's the best way of putting it right um but you know as the movie develops there's long there's long points for me at least where I'm not actually sure what I'm watching. It's, it's a quasi documentary, but they're harpening back to different points with specific characters. So it seems like the story is kind of fragmented up until where you get to the end. And then you realize that it's not just a movie. It's like a series of small stories that develop a picture for you to look at. And I think that's why so many people have so many different takes on this movie being really good or maybe not being their cup of tea. Um, I kind of land somewhere in the middle there, but I think definitely this is a movie that people should take a look at just for the uniqueness that it presents. What, what about you? Comparison that I keep making to the Taking Deborah Logan is the idea that there's this documentary style. It's a mockumentary, uh, if you will. This idea that people are approaching a story that they've heard about and they're capturing the... Um, people's responses to an event that's happened. This one though, Lake Mungo, 
I think is really the most complex in terms of that sort of documentary style of found footage, right? Because you've got the mockumentary, but then there's also like docufication elements where you have them like sorting through paperwork and police reports and news footage. And then the interviews aren't sort of just people reacting to an immediate event. It's an event that happened and then months go by. And it's not only just talking to the family, but it's talking to the police. It's talking to friends, people that knew Alice. Um, and then it's even people that have no direct connection to it. Like at one point, we've learned that there's a video that somebody's captured that was at the uh, was at the pond where she died, but we didn't even know who these people were for the first 35, 40 minutes of the movie, right? So there's kind of like this very just inorganic nature with which a lot of the sort of information um, surrounding this case comes from that really makes it feel like it is an ever evolving story where uh, the taking Deborah Logan is very much in the moment. It's very reactionary to something. Lake Mungo, there's a lot of sort of development time in terms of this story. It's unfolding over the course of weeks and months. And there's something to that, I think, in making it feel authentic in a way where it feels sort of like a quasi mystery or it is a mystery. And just seeing people go through the different steps in uncovering that mystery and all these different developments that come to life it's a really surprising blending of genres and of film techniques, I think. I mean, the movie goes from obviously a haunting because you find like, as soon as she dies, they start experiencing these supernatural events. But then you find out, oh wait, this is a hoax per perpetrated by the brother where he's splicing her images into cameras and old videos and things like that. But then after that, again, you learn like more about Alice's secrets. And then all of a sudden it becomes like a true crime doc. So to the film's credit, despite how well it may succeed at all these different kinds of genres it dabbles in, I was really impressed with how Lake Mungo was able to keep you guessing. And for me, that really kept me engaged with it, where, like you had said, I didn't feel comfortable in knowing what I was watching for like a good three fourths of the film, right? Because it's ever evolving and shifting and changing. And you really don't know the directions it's going in. And for me, I think I would agree with the way that you characterized it as it's a very uniquely made movie, especially within the context of uh, the found footage genre like you and I have been talking about. Well, so to, to that point, I think you hit on something that's super important, right? In comparing this, comparing, contrasting this with the, the taking of Deborah Logan. The taking of Deborah Logan, you are getting reactions essentially when certain things were happening to Deborah Logan, right? As her mental health deteriorated, you were getting like one-on-ones or insights either with her or her daughter, or the camera crew around there, right? This is different in that, again, we've had time, the characters have had time to digest what had happened. And so they're giving their perspective, not just on her death, but how it impacted them, which is a little bit different than like the raw footage that we get from taking a Deborah Logan, right? Um, so to that effect, like when, you know, when I was watching this, and this was my first time ever watching uh, Lake Mungo, but as soon as that her brother says that this was a fake or that it was a hoax, he was like, I, I didn't really understand quite how he was doing, but he was like overlapping her photo. Yeah, he was he was basically splicing her image into photos he had taken to try to make it seem as if like her ghost was appearing. And he does it with the videos as well, um, just to kind of like, because. Mm -hmm. This is actually something that we can get into, right? Is this idea that the film is more, like I would obviously describe this as a horror movie, but at the mm -hmm. same time, it's more about grief and it's more about how people internalize grief and how people process grief differently rather than it being this kind of traditional haunting film, right? Because throughout the film, the family says, oh, we heard strange noises, we saw strange things, and yet, it's more about their grief and the ways in which that manifests itself, right? The father goes to work and doesn't talk about it and buries himself in work, which his coworkers like, it's pretty upsetting, but I don't know how to talk to him about it. And I don't know if it's my place to, to bring it up to him. Whereas the mother doesn't believe mm -hmm. it, right? And they kind of talk about this idea that the father has closure because he identifies the body and the mother didn't want to look at the bot, the waterlogged body that they drug out of the uh, dam or the river. And, the brother, the way that he reacts to it is, is that he makes this hoax up about being, seeing her ghost. But 
Mm -hmm. The reasons why he does it, they almost don't really explain, except he says something along the lines of like, oh, I thought it would give mom hope or something like that. So it's really interesting to get three different perspectives of how people deal with grief. And while the film Mm -hmm. does veer back into the supernatural, obviously, towards the second half of the film, it's still a very legitimate uh, examination of grief. And it's one that I think is very rare in how accurately it's depicted, right? I think a lot of times this is not even just um, something that found footage films struggle with sometimes, but just like horror films in general sometimes, especially like low budget ones you've never heard of, their portrayal of grief Mm -hmm. can sometimes, they can talk up grief. And yet how often is it really accurately depicted? It's kind of like, oh, you mentioned that they're dealing with grief and it's like, yeah, you get a character that like runs to a bottle and then five minutes later, there's another haunting and then they forget about their grief. And it's just a series of sort of like schlocky exploitations of grief. It's just kind of these like things moving around the house or whatever, these very sort of stereotypical uh, depictions of that. And so to Lake Mm -hmm. Mungo's credit, I think it's it feels like a very human tackling of the subject of grief. And it's done so in a way that feels not only organic, but it doesn't feel like it's in service of like scares or something to that extent. It just feels like very, there's a lot of very human moments in this film that are scattered amongst the few kind of like overtly scary moments of the film. And I think what you said there is key, right? It's, this is not a movie that within 20 minutes, you're going to feel some sort of satisfaction from watching it. Um, if anything, honestly, after 30 minutes, you'll be a little frustrated about like what the hell is going on. So it's very slow, uh, slow to develop. But um, the movie itself, though, right? Like, if you just look at, you look at that scene where we realize that um, the brother is admitting that he created a hoax. In my head, honestly, I tapped out and I was ready to kind of quit on this movie. But to your point, though, right? it's grief so if you look at it from that perspective it's very logical for somebody to do something like that he's i believe he was her younger brother again to your point he's trying to in some weird way present hope to his mom even if it's not necessarily that that's the right way of producing it but that's neither here nor there um but the thing that to me was i took it as like a huge like mark against Lake Mungo. And then towards the end of the movie, I actually started realizing that it was a plus for them. The footage that we kept seeing, like the the photos or the videos where she would somehow be in the corner or whatever, they were super grainy and I could barely see it. Like I had a genuinely difficult time watching it. And just from that perspective of clarity, uh, I don't know if you felt the same way, but it's it kind of reminded me a little bit of our discussion with the Blair Witch Project of if we actually see what we think we're seeing, like we full like fully actually see what they're trying to present to us. If the 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 cosmetics aren't necessarily there, it's gonna ruin what we're actually trying to to look at or the the concept behind what's what's behind that scare, right? Um, so when they would like. There was a scene uh, when they find her phone and they're looking at what seems to be her own, like before uh, before rigor mortis hit or whatever on her body, but her dead corpse basically staring back at her in a phone. That's eerie as hell, but you don't actually see it fully pixelized. So then it doesn't give you, a, it doesn't give you an ammunition or a reason to be like, oh, this isn't real. You know what I mean? It gives you just enough ammo to go, that is actually super fucking creepy. And imagine imagining you in that position of like, if I was looking at a phone that showed my own death essentially on it or the the end result of that, how would you feel about that, right? And then some of the decisions that start to happen from her perspective start to there, there's at least a little bit more logic behind why the, the dominoes fell the way they did, if that makes sense. I think that that's a key thing about Lake Mungo that really separate, again, a credit to its filmmaking in terms of how it's constructed. Everything, feel, the exploration of this case feels very organic and it feels like it's very firsthand with a lot of the sort of evidence that we get. Obviously, something that I really appreciate that the film employs is the dramatizations of things that happen. I love the the inclusion of that, especially when 
the family members start meeting with the uh, parasy, parapsychic uh, for mm-hmm. those sessions where they're sitting in a room and he uh, conveniently he records all his sessions. So like, like those scenes cut between a session that he's recording where his subject is sitting there with their eyes closed, recounting what they see. But then mm-hmm. it cuts between that and it cuts between a dramatization of what they're seeing, of them walking down the hallway. They The little details in this movie too are so pristine, I think, in establishing a mood and a sense of familiarity with like between characters and the setting of it. Like they're talking about how, oh, I'm walking down the hallway and then I see Alice's shoes outside the door. And then the mother goes on a little tangent about Alice would never wear her shoes inside of the house or inside of her bedroom. And then she goes into the room. And I think that it does such a good job of, again, making these feel like people that actually have a relationship. And this is something also that I wanted to bring up um, is the performances in the film. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that, and this is going to sound like it's a slight against the film, but in actuality, I think it really, really actually helps the film. A lot of the performances in this film feel very unprofessional in a way like I was looking through the IMDb and this was one of the early if not the only film that some people in the movie were actually in and Mm -hmm. it sounds like a slight but in actuality I think it really helps with just Lake Mungo's capturing of its story and feeling like this is a very like discovery period of a case we feel like we're in the trenches digging through clues and these feel Mm -hmm. like like regular people they don't feel like actors that are experiencing this, with which really gives this film a level of immersion that I think mm-hmm. eludes a lot of the found footage or just, I mean, films in general, right? Because you've got uh, actors that are well-trained that you've probably seen in other things when they pop up. It takes you out of it a little bit. But right. in Lake Mungo, these are people that you and I have never seen before. And also, mm-hmm. they're not the most seasoned actors. So there are some imperfections in their performance that really, really worked for me in this case that you never think, oh, these are actors being interviewed this feels like a family that is grappling with this horrific event and these are their honest to goodness reactions to how they're feeling the things that they're experiencing Um, and i was also interested to learn that there's no written dialogue for the film there was only an outline of the story so the actors improvised which is you mentioned blair witch project that's not unlike the blair witch project right that idea that you have the story structure and the outline And yet it's up to the actors to sort of ad lib, essentially. And I think that that does a lot in making this feel, again, very organic. It feels like genuine conversations and you can feel like genuine pain in these people that are by no means seasoned actors. And yet that's exactly who you want for a movie like this, where if you're going to buy into the sort of mockumentary style and not have it come off as goofy, you want to be believe you want them to be believable, to feel like genuine people. You know, the, the interesting thing to me about this movie, or one of the, the interesting aspects, was this movie centers around someone's death, but in reality, it kind of starts exploring the hidden truth about, I, I, envision, or I imagine all of us, that we all have certain aspects of our life that are hidden to ourselves or closed off, and even the people that are closest to you might not be aware of it. Um, like there was, uh, I I forget which photo it was, but it was some, at some point in like the middle, middle to end of the the movie. But, um, basically there's like a scene where Alice in theory, like runs across the, uh, she like runs across the room or something like that, or, uh, outside and her mom like has a freeze frame of it. And she notices this is after the brother had mentioned like he had done some hoaxes, but then there's a photo or excuse me in the photo hidden in a portion of it is the neighbor like creeping in the room. And to me, it was weird. That was actually the scariest part of the movie to me. And it had nothing to do with the actual daughter. It was more, well, it, you know what I mean by that, but um, it didn't necessarily include her directly, but Um, that was something for me where I was like, I'm starting to get that this isn't, 
this isn't just a simple movie about a discovery or a family grieving like there's an underlying horror to this and so again that's what we keep going back and forth on like this is a horror movie but it's very untraditional in in the way that we think of horror movies but it does continue once you start realizing where this is kind of going or the different avenues that this can take um i started feeling a sense of dread of like not only do i have no idea where this movie is actually going and it's slightly confusing to that effect too but like the the unknown obviously as we've talked about in any kind of horror movie our minds start to create a mental picture that might be worse than what we're actually dealing with. And in that itself is where some horror movies are really great. I think this movie really did a good job of building different avenues for at, of which we could go down and letting us try and take, you know, take it to that direction. Um, and then it kind of just, you know, it made a, a, a scene at the very end that kind of solidified this movie, in my opinion, being a, a very underrated and bizarre movie, but underrated nonetheless. It's, it's a very interesting take on it. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think that I would say that the movie is more unnerving than it is mm -hmm. tr like traditionally scary in a lot of ways because of like the moment that you just mentioned, right? We, we are shown so many brief instances, uh, or not brief, but we see many instances where you see a video that's frozen or freeze framed, or you see still photos that show Alice's ghost in them. But then we learn, oh, the brother purported this hoax to give his mother hope and all these things to try to bring them closer together in some kind of like twisted way. And then you start revisiting pieces of evidence and you start noticing other things in them. And I think that that is very, very unsettling and just very creepy. It's not traditionally scary, but it is very creepy. This idea that because throughout the film, there are uh, several instances of this, right? You see different photos and the camera either lingers on them or zooms in on them in a certain way that it's not obscuring, but you wouldn't notice because you're not meant to notice certain things. And then mm -hmm. when we start revisiting pieces of evidence, you start noticing that there are things in these images that the brother has nothing to do with. Like mm -hmm. the one where he takes the photo and then of the backyard and then he superimposes Alice into it. If you look in another corner of the picture, you can see Alice in the bushes and he yeah. didn't do that one. Or like you said, there's the freeze frame from the camera of Alice or a figure supposedly walking down the hall. He superimposed that, but then you see the neighbor creeping in the corner of the photo hiding in her room, which that is one of those, that's like a, uh, your hair stands up on end moment. Cause it's like, you could have seen that from the very beginning of the movie. You just mm -hmm. weren't, well, you, there's no reason why you would look in the corner of that photo. And that's something that as soon as the movie ends, it was very disconcerting for me in a way that very few films are able to do where it kind of like shook me in a way because I'm like, holy shit, all of these moments, especially the way that the film opens, spo mm -hmm. like I mean, we we're talking about spoilers throughout, but just like super mega spoiler if you haven't seen Lake Mungo, the way that the film opens, you get that family picture of the mom, the dad, and the brother. Obviously, Alice is dead at that point. And mm -hmm. then at the uh, end of the film, we see that photo again, but now it zooms in a little bit more and you can see Alice's ghost standing in a window by, uh, in the house. You can yeah. see that in the, op I went back to the beginning of the film, you can see that. You just have no reason to look in that window when the film starts. And so the way in which that they're able to layer scares in this movie, I think, or just very, very creepy moments, I'm yeah. really appreciative of because it feels like a discovery which in turn aids the entire discovery process of the film of it going from, oh, this is a haunting to this is a hoax to this is a true crime element back to a haunting, a legitimate haunting this time. And that's an element of the film that makes it very layered in a way that, like you had said, I didn't know what I was watching for three fourths of the movie. And how often do we get to say that about a movie where you're like, okay, you described it as being frustrating, but I describe it as being exciting because I don't know about you, but I'm so used to like the blueprint for certain types of movies, right? For haunting movies. When the movie starts and Alice is drowned and we get the news reel footage and everything, and then the family says, oh, we heard strange things in the house. I assume that this was going to be like shit just moving around the house. Like, are we going to get 25 minutes of furniture stacking mysteriously or I don't know, glasses of water moving or levitate, like stuff like that that's very traditional. But to watch, especially a found footage movie that doesn't have a clear blueprint of where it's going, I find to be very engaging and exciting, even if 
it doesn't deliver a litany of sort of these traditional scares. Yeah, I mean, so obviously we've we've talked about quite a few, and you've you've mentioned a couple, or you've done reviews rather of of other movies in the found footage uh, genre, or that are are reminiscent of this movie. What what would you put on a scale of of one to ten for this movie? And do you think after discussing this, do you have a uh, more positive things to say, more negative, uh, kind of equal or neutral rather? Uh, I think I'm I'm strong on this movie. I think I'm stronger on it the more because I watched it last night before we recorded, um, and then thinking about it all day and jotting down my notes and obviously getting to talk to you about it. I'm really appreciative of just how well the movie is constructed and how different it is and how this film could have just been a very simplistic haunting narrative. But there's so many twists and turns. And again, I was so engaged and enraptured with the sort of uh, trajectory that the film takes and it being so unexpected in the ways that it goes. And there are a couple of narrative things that I don't necessarily think ever really connected the way that they should have maybe, or maybe they didn't have as big of a significance as I thought they were going to. But overall, I'm really impressed with this movie. And I mean, we're going to get into in a little bit the the kind of like big scare of the film that really scared the shit out of me in a way that I haven't felt in a very long time. So I do want to get into that. But um, I mean, in terms of a score, I'm probably dancing around like an eight just because of a seven and a half or an eight just because of how well the movie's constructed. Again, it's a mm -hmm. horror movie. Obviously, that's not up for debate, but it does lack a lot of traditional scares. And I almost would want more moments like that, that we had gotten the moment in the desert, which we'll talk about. Um, I wish we had gotten probably like two or three more of those moments mm -hmm. throughout the film. But then again, the entire film is essentially building to that moment. And I don't know if that moment is as effective if we are not getting, we don't have any other moments like that leading up to it, right? Because yeah. I legitimately, and let's, fuck it, we'll just get into it and we'll circle back to uh, some other things I wanted to talk about. But that moment where the family finds the cell phone footage where it's uh, Alice and her friends out in the desert and she's distraught, she's burying something. The family then goes to Lake Mungo and then they mm -hmm. dig up this bag that has her cell phone and all these things in it. And then the cell phone video that Alice has is her walking in the desert and she sees a bloated corpse, which is her. Yeah. It's herself. And you mentioned it, you uh, referenced it earlier. She essentially, before her own death, was greeted by her corpse. And that is sort of like a premonition. And that moment, it's just a very blurry image. But then it is a jump scare moment, right? Because then a lot of the videos that we've seen have been static or it's been something moving just like left and right. But yeah. then this very blurry image that you can clearly make out and know what it is it lunges at the screen and lunges at Alice and it screams or there's a static sound. And that made me jump out of my fucking skin. And <laughs> that's the only jump scare in the movie. And that mm -hmm. I think for me is an example of when people say jump scares are cheap or they're stupid, that's a fantastic jump scare because it's yeah. effective. It's building mm -hmm. to that scare. The entire film, you're not trained or you're not primed that there'll be a moment like that. And yeah, it's the scene. There's nothing more to it than what I just described. And it's very simplistic, but the way in which it is employed in the film and the overall sort of just construction of the film, it's building to that moment. And if the film gave us a couple of jump scares in between, that moment would not be nearly as rewarding as I found it to be. What, I mean, what did you think of that moment? Was that kind of like the oh shit moment for you too? Um, I, I would say that it's definitely, I, I definitely felt freaked out the, we've had conversations in the past of like sometimes it's not just the horror that we're seeing but it's either the sound effects or the um the artistic design that's around it right um the music or whatever that static noise that that hit as we we kind of zoomed in on what we realized was her dead body essentially or her uh her corpse um, that just freaked me out to a whole new level because I don't think we hear that sound at all through the movie. I, I'm pretty sure that's the only time that sound kind of hit there as well. Um, so it was a number of things that that freaked me out and that my my personal kind of, there was like two or three really scary scenes in this movie. That's one of them noticing that um, her neighbor was like hiding in her room basically. That's that 
shit freak the hell out. Um, and there's another one where she's uh, there's like a photo basically, and if you, as they zoom in, they see her like looking in a mirror mm-hmm. at them yeah. somehow. I, I maybe I'm not describing it that well, but um, there's like a couple of those scenes that are super freaky. Again, this movie isn't built, in my opinion for scares it's more built for the uneasiness and those cringy moments of like realizing what we're actually witnessing right um i i personally again looking back on this i think i'd rate this more of like a five or a six um you know we talked about everyone has different kind of viewpoints on the way this picture ended up coming together um i thought I agree with your point wholeheartedly that if there were any other jump scares before um, that video scene, it would have it would have neutered it somewhat, right? Because we would have been somewhat ready for something like that. But it was so long to get to that point. Like those first thirty minutes for me, I, you know, it, it was just long to to get to that point for me. So I think if there was a little bit more. I don't know, the, the dialogue was better. The story was just a little bit cleaner and getting to that point. Maybe I would have a, a higher score for these guys. Um, but the second half is, in my opinion, it's like an eight out of 10 versus the first half is like a two out of 10. So it kind of meets in the middle, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess I was more taken with the imperfections in terms of this feeling of uh, fueling rather the unease that I felt, right? Because again, a lot of times, I don't know, I can enjoy all types of horror movies, but it's like when you see an entire cast of people that you're familiar with, it definitely takes you out of it a little bit. This idea that like, oh, you can't not think like, oh, I recognize that person. They were in so and so or I saw them in this. But with all these little imperfections and it being a cast I'm unsure of and I don't really know what type of movie I'm watching for a majority of it, like those things really kept me on edge. And I, I totally agree, though, with you about if we had been primed early on for a jump scare like that or they had used that sound like. The way that I'm describing it too, it's those are the things that people hate about jump scares where it's like this loud uh, static noise or stinger. But when there's one of them in the film, it's not, you can't be mad at it because it's like, well, yeah, they can be effective. It's just people's over um, over reliance on using them is what really I think pisses people off because you're like, yeah, if you see anything again, it's like to come back to the uh, age old adage where if you show the monster in the first 15 minutes, you're going to be bored as shit by the end of the movie because, hey, we've seen everything that this has to offer. So I think it's, again, a really expertly employed use of that. But again, just be- it's not effective just because it's the only one. It's a bonus that it's the only one and that kind of fuels it to be more effective. But I think it's just that the film is building to that in yeah. a way that it spends so much time for me making me uneasy and uncomfortable that I'm really, really on the edge of my seat in a way that it could have been anything. Even if it was not a jump scare, I would have still been on edge the whole movie. And and one thing that I really think was what kept me engaged all the way through again was that I accepted at a certain point that this is not a traditional haunting film. And Mm -hmm. I would almost not even describe it as that. It's obviously deals with ghosts and things like that, but it really is more about grief. It's a film, like somebody described it as psychological horror and I think there might be a component to that, but I would even be hesitant to describe it as that because it is more about these people dealing with grief. And right. something that I didn't think about until obviously the next day I had some time to process it was that if the entire haunting had been a hoax, right? And even though it takes this trajectory of haunting, hoax, true crime, but then if it had gone back to being a hoax, the exploration of these characters' trauma and grief is still portrayed in a very believable way. There's no por- there's no element to that that I felt was exaggerated or done for dramatic effect or it was done in service of like some cheap schlocky scares that we've seen time and time again. Like there is a trajectory to the family's grief of this doubt and then obviously the hoax and then, oh, this is actually happening. But then they even find closure. And mm-hmm. I think that closure element is really important, right? The film doesn't end on this ambiguous note of, Oh, did they really get like all haunting movies essentially? And like, oh, we spent all this time getting rid of the haunting. And then the last 90 seconds, it's like, oh, the haunting's still there. That was all for (laughs) naught kind of thing. This film, the family actually gets closure 
-hmm. And in their finding closure, yeah, it ties it up in a nice bow for an ending of a film. But it's more about the fact that they've gone through a very untraditional but very legitimate grief arc, right? Again, if she had just drowned in the end, it's still tragic, whether there's a haunting or not. And I think that the families coming to terms with that is one that is deeply rooted in some truth. Like, thank God, knock on wood, thank God, I haven't experienced anything like that myself. But it's this idea that, again, I think the imperfections in the actors' performances or just in the structure of them making up their own dialogue and ad-libbing, there's something to that that was very emotional for me in a way that I was not expecting. And especially like cutting back and forth between um, the mockumentary style, but then all the home movie stuff with Alice and showing her a much happier time and things like that. I mean, to, uh, to Joel Anderson's credit, that was a really phenomenal use of various styles of found footage. And it was something that I think really took this story in a direction that I myself was not expecting. And it's something that I haven't seen done to this depth in any other found footage movies that I've seen yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with you on a couple of points. I mean, I think we, we've touched on it a couple of times, but you know, we, we were having a conversation previously to this of uh, Hacksaw Ridge. And I had mentioned, you know, as much as I enjoy Vince Vaughn in certain comedies, uh, <laughs> seeing him as like a dramatic actor or anything outside of a comedic uh, role is very difficult for me. There are actors that we both agree, like if we saw a really, I, I can't think of any like I'm sure there are obviously a plethora of them, but like any really good like Australian actors off the top of my head. No Gibson. If we saw, uh, <laughs> but uh, for other purposes here, or there. But um, you know, if we saw someone that was a little bit more established, then it might take away from the content of the actual movie and focus on a character. Whereas mm -hmm. I think. And I think we would both agree the lack of uh, us being super intrigued by any one character made all of the characters actually stand out in their own unique way, rather than being like, this one guy is an asshole or this one guy is like, or the one guy, guy or gal is like super interesting. And then it kind of drowns out the rest of them. Um, I think they did a really good job of having a core group of a core cast that was unique and bland in the best way possible. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think where we differ, though, is, is that in no particular family member being a standout performance and them kind of, I, I hesitate to refer to them as bland, but just not a standout, right? It feels just, it feels very honest. Mm -hmm. And in that honesty, there is just them expressing how they feel and trying to articulate their headspace for where they were at, where they're at now their uncertainty about the future, about dealing with this event and how it affects them long term. I think in that it allows it to be an examination of the family's grief as a whole, rather than any particular one being a standout. Um, obviously, they all, all three family members that are still alive react very differently. And I think that that's important, too. Right. That's key. You can't. Who's going to give a shit if everybody grieves the same? This is very sad. Like, OK, I don't want to hear three different people say that because I know it's sad. How does it manifest itself in being sad or unfortunate or depressing? And so I think it's key that they do a good job of at least showing different portrayals of that. Um, and something that, again, I think is really strong considering the film had story structure, but it had them ad lib their lines were a lot of little details. Like when Alice's father talks about in the interview and it, funny i forgot to mention the director is actually the guy doing the interviews behind the camera uh, oh. throughout the film and he wasn't credited for it but he is the voice of the person uh, playing the interview interviewer um but alice's father has this little anecdote where he talks about he still leaves the porch light on at night and the interviewer is like well why do you do that he's like well in case she comes home like that's a very to me that seems like a very genuine thing that a parent would say and it feels like a very vulnerable thing because he he laughs when he says that it's a very vulnerable moment. And he says, and he laughs because he knows that the reality is, is that she's not going to come home, but he's a parent and he's a grieving parent and he's not going to allow himself, even if he has closure that his wife doesn't have because he identified the body. He still has a glimmer of hope that she's still alive somehow, even if it defies reality. And I mean, even 
little moments like they talk about when they're driving back from, I think it was when they were driving back from identifying the body. For whatever reason, the car won't uh, shift into forward drive. So he has to drive in reverse back to town, which is a very bizarre moment. And yeah. it's kind of, it's like a little silly, but at the same time, like there is a tragedy in that. And it's kind of like seeing how this family can deal with this horrific tragedy. And then on top of that, their car won't drive forwards. So they have to drive in reverse back to town to get a taxi or whatever to get to their house. Yeah. I mean, I think it was, uh, uh, I forget who said this, but it's like sometimes to go forward, you have to go backwards. And so maybe that was an ode to that, or maybe I saw that in some sort of like a Snapple cap or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, but no, that, <laughs> that is definitely a, an interesting interesting thing scene that happens and there's a i'm sure if we watch it again there's things that that go under the radar but again I, I you know we've hit on this a couple of times and that is actually the the real beauty of this movie is that i'm sure in watching it in a second or third time you would pick up on things whether it's in photos whether it's in the dialogue of any of the the characters different small tidbits that would help kind of put the pieces of the movie together quicker. Um, but yeah, I mean, the more we talk, the more I, I want to give the benefit of the doubt to Lake Mungo and up my, my uh, ranking with these guys. Um, would you say that like, you know, after we've gotten all this out as a found footage film, do you think, and not just for uh, horror, just in general found footage, do you think this would rank in like a top 10 for you? Oh, absolutely. This is probably a top five. Well, let's keep it a top 10. This is definitely a top 10 for me um, mm. just because I love the construction of it. Again, it's very untraditional to all the other horror, uh, found footage horror movies that we've been talking about. I think those are a lot more overtly horror. But with this... I love the construction of it. I love the blendings of it, different styles, documentary style, dramatizations, the different genres that it dips its toes in. And while it is a very untraditional in terms of scares, I think it's still effective in what it does, right? It's, it's a movie that is scary. It's a movie that's unnerving. It's a movie that for me is engaging. It's a movie that draws a lot of emotions out of me that I don't think I've had another found footage film do other than fear or i mean in the case of deborah logan right it's sad it's kind of depressing because you see this woman going through the stages of dementia and all these things and obviously that movie goes in some pretty demonic places but for the first half of that film there isn't anything overtly supernatural or overly drama dramatized about it this idea that the disease the portrayal of the disease is a realistic one it's one that is respectful to the source that it's touching upon or the subject matter that it's covering. And Lake mm -hmm. Mungo, I feel, does a similar thing throughout the entire film though, and in that is to tackle grief, the concept of grief and trauma and these things in a way that doesn't feel exploitive of a very real world emotion, something that people feel every day and, fe and have felt for whatever, thousands of years and lots of different scenarios and things like that. And yet the scares of the film don't feel like they're just there to be exploitive of that. And it is a very legitimate exploration of those uh, those feelings and things. And I think, again, for a film that is untraditionally scary, it doesn't have an abundant, like taking the smart route and not having this abundance of cheap throwaway moments. Mm -hmm. That requires a lot of restraint. Let's be honest. A lot of horror filmmakers that have dabbled in found footage have been like, hey, let's throw a ton of these sort of just cheap little throwaway moments in there. Um, but this film didn't have any of that for me. And I understand that's the thing too. Like as much as I'm talking up this film, I understand that this is not going to be for a lot of people. Probably this idea that like, yeah, it's a found footage film. That's horror, but there aren't a lot of scary moments in it. And I've seen some people say like, it's boring or whatever, but I think the more that you think about it. And I mean, like you had just said, I am dying to revisit it at some point, just so I can start to pick up on other things. But also I'm curious to see how my appreciation for the film holds up when I know where it's going. Because that was a big thing for me in watching the film was not knowing where it's going. And that's a big deal for me now because I mean, I don't know, watch a ton of movies every week and every month and whatever, every year. After a while, you get a certain sense of like the blueprint of where something's heading. And to tackle a movie 
I'll compare it to Parasite, obviously two very different films, but that was a movie that you cannot see the blueprint of that movie coming if you go into a blind like I did, or like yeah. everybody should go into that movie, right? It's this idea that it presents itself as one thing, and then it goes in a completely different direction. And right. even though Lake Mungo begins as a haunting and ends up ending as a haunting, the path to getting there is very, very different. And it goes in a lot of different directions. And that's exciting and that's engaging for me. And I felt that it was satisfying the way that it tackled multiple genres. And yet there's a level of detail to each bit like that, that has the same level of um, execution. It was executed on a way that was memorable, that was engaging. It wasn't kind of just distracting for the sake of being distracting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think you hit the nail on the head on that. I mean, I, it, I'm i trying to think like for found footage, this is definitely in my top 10. Um, I probably would rank it realistically somewhere seven to 10 rather than like five to one, you know? Um, or one to five rather, I would, but I would agree with that. Cause there's just, when you start to think about it again, like there are some found footage movies a la, um, uh, the Blair Witch project. It's really hard to kind of top that, you know, in a top three or something, but, um, is there a follow up to this movie? There is not. And actually the director hasn't made anything since, um, he directed a short or he wrote a short in like 2013, but he hasn't done a feature film since, which is unfortunate because I think that his handling of the subject matter was really well done. His execution and capturing it and again, making a very complexly constructed uh, found footage film, or at least more of a cocktail, I, I assume, uh, or I would say rather uh, a cocktail of different styles and variations and things like that. Um, yeah. So it's disappointing that he hasn't done anything since, but I'm always going to uh, I'm always going to root for somebody to make a comeback because Lake Mungo is definitely a film that I think I appreciate it as a piece of filmmaking and then also as a haunting movie, right? And that sounds like kind of pretentious and douchey to say, but just the way that it's able to take things that are very familiar and it's able to blend them in a way that feels new or refreshing. And even if at the end of the movie you end up being like, well, yeah, that kind of is just an example of this style of filmmaking or this genre, this influence. The way that they're all put together felt very, um, created a lot of unease and it fueled a lot of tension in the movie, especially when, again, talking about them cutting, uh, cutting between different styles, right? You cut between found footage and you cut to a dramatization that feels like you're watching a true crime documentary. All these different elements, I think, are just really they are uh, harmonized in one in terms of just like making them flow really fluidly in between uh, one another. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, I don't want to spoiler alert with the next uh, potential movies that we, we evaluate, but um, I doubt that there's going to be too much uh, like deep insight that you need to take on them if we, uh, if we end up going that route. <laughs> one other thing that I'd just like to say in terms of like a haunting is like what is at the core of a haunting, right? I think a lot of people, when you think of a haunting movie or a haunted house movie, it's that, oh, stuff is gonna move around. But yeah. for this film feels like a true haunting in that you can feel like it, I don't know if I would say like very, it's, uh, it's a realistic haunting, but it kind of is the pure embodiment of a haunting, this idea there is a presence. It makes mm -hmm. itself known to you. It fundamentally affects people, but it's less about like, literally the haunting itself and it's more about what it brings out of people that are still alive and how it affects them um, and I think that that is an element of the film that I mean it's just a portrayal of a haunting that I don't think is very common anymore because of what people's uh, expectations or preconceived notions of what a haunting is are like there's this filmmaker Oz Perkins um, who kind of specializes in these types of haunting films now and for the mm -hmm. most part I mean, I, I guess I won't say for the most part, everybody has fans, everybody has uh, harsh critics, but like I know, I've know, i noticed when you look at the ratings on like Letterboxd or whatever on um, Google movie ratings, like his movies tend to have a lot of negative reviews because people say they're slow, they're boring, nothing happens, those types of critiques. But right. really his movies are about characters and how things affect them rather than, and yeah, you get a couple of creepy moments that are very memorable, but it's not this sort of like litany or assault of these um, like 
modern hauntings where it's like shit's moving around and flying and loud noises and banging and stingers and all these things that have become synonymous with hauntings over the years because it's kind of like these cheap thrills that you're inundated with. And now, even if you bitch about those things, you still associate them with a specific genre because of how common they are. Mm -hmm. And to see another filmmaker tackle haunting in a way that feels more traditional, kind of like Oz Perkins does now with a lot of his modern movies, um, it's something that I'm definitely a fan of, but it is something that I understand why people... I mean, if you're not really open-minded about watching movies that, that are not something that you're familiar with or it kind of presents something that you're not used to watching, I get why this is off-putting or strange to you. But, I mean, it's one of those things where, like, I'm always on my soapbox talking about, like, be more open-minded about what you can expect or what you can enjoy. Watch other types of movies. Watch things that, even if everything we've described doesn't sound like Lake Mungo would be for you, give it a shot. It's less than 90 minutes and chances are it'll be better than you just kind of like throwing on some other bullshit that you don't know anything about, but you're like, Oh, that's kind of seems familiar. Like take a gamble once in a while. Cause the only reason I ended up watching this and us talking about it is that, Oh, it popped up on shutter, it popped up on prime video, it popped up on Tubi. So that's an excuse to kind of tackle this movie and get to talk about it now. So, I mean, getting to uh, roll the dice on a movie every once in a while is always great. Cause it kind of, allows us to have this conversation, but then also kind of just to talk about the zeitgeist of horror in general and kind of like why this movie stands out or what it could have done better. So yeah, this was definitely a fun one to uh, to finally get a chance to sit down and watch and to chat about it with you. A hundred percent, man. I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, people need to stop watching reruns of The Office and SV. <laughs> Yes. Dive into something new. So I'm, uh, you know, again, that's why I love uh, talking about these films with you is because I would never in my life have thought about watching Lake Mungo and, um, you know, getting these kinds of movies and, and exploring them. That's, that's what this is all, all the fun is about. So I, I definitely appreciate, uh, appreciate you, man. Thanks. Well, this was a blast as always. And I look forward to, uh, We'll see. Keeping the conversation going with found footage, maybe take a break, a little deviation, but I'll definitely have you on in the future again to talk about horror. Thanks for joining me, Bernie. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Daily Horror Habit on your preferred streaming service and follow the show on Instagram at Daily Horror Habit and on Twitter at Daily Horror Pod for episode updates. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.